This evening we're continuing our overview of the Old Testament book titled 2 Kings. And as you open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6, I want to take a moment to put our text back into its context. It's here in our text tonight where we find more details about the miraculous ministry of the prophet Elisha. But now before we examine the miracles found here in this exciting chapter, we should spend some time recapping the miracles that uh, we found in the previous chapters of this book. Remember, it was back in 2 Kings chapter 2 where we learned about the day when the Lord empowered Elisha to part the Jordan River. And it was there in the same chapter where he also healed the bitter waters there in Jericho. Then in chapter 3, the Lord used him to fill a desert valley with water so that the armies of Israel could be refreshed. And then the Lord also caused those waters to appear to look like blood, which then caused the Moabites to lose the battle. In chapter 4, the Lord enabled Elisha to provide financial aid for a a widow by multiplying her olive oil. And he also prophetically promised that uh, there would be a barren woman who would have a son. And then then years later, her son uh, suddenly died. and, And that's when the Lord empowered Elisha to restore the life of that boy. We also learned about the way that the Lord enabled Elisha to to detoxify a stew which was made of poisonous wild gourds. And not only that, but the Lord also used him to multiply the loaves of bread. And then in chapter 5, Well, we learned about the day when Elisha was able to heal a Syrian soldier who had leprosy. And then the Lord revealed the deceptive transgression of Elisha's servant Gehazi. And as a result, the Lord led Elisha to proclaim a punishment upon Gehazi, which resulted in a curse of leprosy that continued to affect his family for years to come. Now, as we consider this quick recap of Elisha's incredible ministry, I'm excited to tell you that this is only half of the miracles that the Lord accomplished through the the ministry of this mighty man of faith. Now, as we make our way through this exciting and and also tragic chapter, it's my hope that the ministry of Elisha will continue to help us to realize that the Lord is always ready to help those who seek him first. With this as our focus, let's turn our attention now to the events that unfold here in 2 Kings chapter 6. If you would look with me, we'll begin reading at verse 1. Here we learn that the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Now here in the beginning of this chapter, we learn about this day when the housing for Elisha's school of ministry had reached its capacity. And as a result, the students at that school, uh, they were here called the sons of the prophets. They sought permission from the prophet Elisha so that they could go and expand upon their facility, which would allow Elisha to then accept more students. I can assure you that Elisha was well pleased with their proactive zeal to serve the Lord in this way. And the reason why I say this is because, listen, it's always easy to find people who are ready to complain about the current conditions. Anybody can accomplish verse 1. It's the people who accomplish verse 1 and verse 2 that are most impressive to those who are in leadership. You see, the world is filled with people who are quick to proclaim their criticisms without offering any solutions. They love to complain but that's just where it ends. They, they present the complaint of verse one without the solution found in verse two. And with that being the case, Elisha was pleased with these students because they didn't just complain about the size of their cramped living quarters. No, instead, they also provided a solution which included a personal commitment to accomplish all of the work necessary for expanding upon the facilities. Now, as we consider the example of those students, I would encourage every Christian to realize that those who voice their complaints about the ministry should also be ready to offer the solutions to the complaints. If you're going to complain, make sure you've got a solution for what you're complaining about. And not only should the complainer offer their solutions, but they should also be ready to step up and serve so that we can work together to make this church a, a wonderful place to worship. Anybody can sit on the armchair and complain about what's happening, uh, but it takes a a real person of faith to step up and say, I'd like to present a solution and be a part of the solution. At the same time, listen, if you aren't ready to step up and become part of the solution, well, then it's probably best to remember what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2 where he declared, do all things without complaining and disputing. Do all things without complaining and disputing. And so if, if all you have to offer is complaints, then do what Paul says and stop complaining and just zip it, you know, just, just, hey, just keep it in your own heart, keep it in your own mind and, keep, and, and take it to the Lord in prayer. 
Christian, listen, if you come to me with a complaint about our ministry, then I'm going to ask you, what are you going to do about it? What's your solution and how are you going to step up to, to make this a better place to worship? At the same time, though, I'm here to tell you, I'm, I'm going to do my part to, to work with those who want to make this church a wonderful place to worship the Lord. And with this in mind, let's consider Elisha's example, which is found here in 2 Kings chapter 6. Look with me there at verse 3. Here we learn that one of the students said, please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. In other words, one of the students here is simply saying, hey, would you come with us? We're going to go to the Jordan. We're going to go start cutting down trees. We're going to gather the lumber necessary to expand upon the facility. Would you, would you please come with us? And that's when Elisha agrees to go and help his students accomplish this building project. And what this means then is that Elisha was happy to serve alongside of his students. He was happy to serve alongside of those who had a passion and a vision to serve the Lord. In similar fashion, I love to serve side by side with those who want to make this church a wonderful place to worship. I was recently looking at the pictures of, of the renovations that we engaged in when we first moved into this facility. It was several months of very hard work. It, it took many long hours over the course of several months. And, and, and looking at those pictures, I just rem, you know, remember what a blast it was to serve alongside of those who had a passion and a vision to turn this building into a place where the Lord is being glorified. Now, it, it saddens me that, that time doesn't permit me to, to be actively involved in every ministry. I, I've worked on my omnipresence, and, and, and it's not working out well. I can't be everywhere doing everything. And, and while I could wish that, that I had the ability to serve side by side with every ministry, it's just completely impossible. At the same time, though, I can assure you that I'm always looking for those who have a passion I'm always looking for those who have a vision to serve the Lord. And it's my prayer that every Christian here at Calvary South Austin would step up and serve the Lord so that together we can edify one another by using the spiritual gifts that we've been given to make this a wonderful place to worship the Lord. I think that Paul put it best in Galatians chapter 5. It's verse 13 where he declares, You, brethren, have been called to liberty. You've been called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Serve one another, he says. Christian, listen, we've been called to, to use the freedom that we have in Christ to serve one another here within our fellowship of faith. And if, and if you think that, does, that this doesn't apply to you, let me assure you, it does. If in your mind you're thinking, well, you know, serving in the church is for everybody else, not for me. I'm here to tell you, no, we've all been called to serve one another here within our fellowship of faith. And, and so rather than spending time complaining about what's wrong with our church, let's love one another with the love of the Lord and let's love one another enough to serve one another according to the gifts and the calling of Christ. And, and not only that, but it's also important to remember that we've been called to serve according to the instructions of those who have been called to lead. And with this as our focus, let's turn our attention back to 2 Kings chapter 6. I want to pick up our study beginning there at verse 4. Here we learn that learned that Elisha went with them and when they came to the Jordan they cut down trees but as one was cutting down a tree the iron axe head fell into the water and he cried out and said alas master for it was borrowed so the man of God said where did it fall and he showed him the place so he cut off a stick and threw it in there and he made the iron float Therefore, he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord, he's now empowering Elisha to perform another incredible miracle. And the reason why I say this is a miracle is because we know uh, a few important truths. First of all, we know that freshly cut wood do don't sink. Secondly, we know that iron don't float. And then thirdly, we know that Charlie don't surf. The third one has nothing to do with this study, but it's just something that we know. But wood doesn't sink and iron doesn't float. And so in order to grasp this miracle, it's important to understand that, that first of all, the Jordan River is a very deep river. It runs with murky, silty water, and so you can't just see in it. Like if you ever go down to Barton Springs, you know, you can look down and see the fish swimming around. It's, it's very clear water. Well, that's not true of the Jordan. It's very murky water. It's, it's silty water. And therefore, Elisha's student wasn't able to see the iron axe head under the water. And listen, there wasn't like Home Depot right down the road where you can just go buy another axe. And it was borrowed, and so he's very worried that it's, it's just lost. It's gone. 
Now, there are some who attempt to explain this miracle by suggesting that Elisha probably thrust the wooden handle into the murky water, and, and though he couldn't see the, the axe head, he somehow connected the axe head uh, with, with, with the handle, and this enabled him to retrieve it you know, from the river, and, and that's an interesting explanation. But even if that's the case, we must agree that this would take some sort of divine guidance of God to, to guide the axe handle straight into uh, the hole of the axe head. Uh, that in and of itself would have been a miracle. At the same time, though, there's no reason textually to believe that that's the explanation. A straightforward understanding of this text would lead us to believe that the Lord reversed the natural order of things by causing wood to sink and then iron to float. In this way, the Lord was continuing to confirm the leadership role of Elisha so that his students might recognize that the Lord was empowering him to provide them with godly guidance, even when that guidance was, was you know, breaking the laws of nature themselves. I like the way that Paul uh, addressed this, the importance of, of godly leadership in Ephesians chapter 4. It's there where he encourages the Christians in Ephesus to understand that the Lord gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ." Simply put, the Lord raises up leaders like Elisha. The Lord raises up apostles. The Lord raises up prophets. The Lord raises up pastor teachers to, to lead his people. And, and, and sometimes with guidance that doesn't make much sense. And in ways that, that are clearly supernatural. But listen, the best way for us to accomplish the work of ministry, the, the best way for us to, to serve together to make this a wonderful place to worship the Lord is by recognizing that the Lord has called some to lead. And, and, and then when our axe head falls in the water and we don't know what to do about it, well, let's look to the leaders of the Lord. Let's look to those leaders that God has raised up to, to provide solutions according to the instru instructions of the one who alone can alter the laws of nature. Now, in order to further grasp the importance of this truth, we should take some time to consider the way that the Lord guides those who have been called to lead. And with this as our focus, let's pick up our study of 2 Kings chapter 6. If you would look with me there, beginning at verse 8. Here we learn that the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. And the king of Israel sent some to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Now here in these verses we find the Lord, he's providing Elisha with military intelligence, which was designed to help the Israelites to escape the ambush of the Syrian army. And as a result of this intel, the Syrian sneak attacks, they were exposed, which caused the king of Syria to conclude that there must be a spy in his home. What he was failing to realize was that the God of Israel was the spy, so to speak. You see, the God of Israel is both omniscient and omnipresent. He's omniscient, which is to say that he's all-knowing. He knows every decision we make before we even make it. Not only that, but he's also omnipresent, which is to say that he exists everywhere all of the time. Now, with that being the case, the, the Lord, the omniscient, omnipresent God, is able to, to reveal the ambush plans of Syria to the king of Israel. And it's also important to notice that the Lord was actually using the prophet Elijah to reveal Syria's battle plans to the king of Israel. The, the Lord wasn't just telling the king of Israel personally, but he was sending the prophet of God. As a matter of fact, look with me there at verse 12, where we learn that one of his servants said, none, my Lord. In other words, there, there is no spy in your house. O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Here in this verse, we find this Syrian servant, he's assuring the king of Syria that there were no spies in his house, there were no military moles in the ranks. No, instead, it was Elisha who was able to expose their attempts to ambush the army of Israel. Well, it's true that Elisha was the one who was exposing their plans to the king of Israel. The king of Syria here is failing to realize that this was only possible because Elisha was serving the true and living God, the omniscient and omnipresent one. 
In order to further prove my point, let's consider how he attempted to deal with his Elisha problem. And if you would look with me there, we'll pick up at verse 13, where the king of Syria declares, go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he is in Dothan. Therefore, he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now, here in these verses, we find the king of Syria, he's attempting to deal with Elisha, and he does this by sending a great army of men to, to capture and kill the prophet of God. Now, as we consider this decision, we must not fail to recognize the, the many problems with his whole approach. First of all, he's sending an army to capture a man who already exposed several ambush attempts. It's like, you don't think that he already knows what you're deciding to do here? Well, I'm, I'm thinking that the king of Syria possibly thought that through, and so he decided to send these guys at night. You know, maybe if we just, you know, roll out this plan while, while Elisha's sleeping, you know, he won't know that, that, they're, that, that you're coming to get him, right? It's completely ridiculous for him to think that he could send this army to capture the man of God, and so he, he sends his men by night to, to, to surround, uh, you know, Elisha's house by night, and this brings us to his second problem, which is based on the fact that Elisha wasn't the spy. Elisha was letting the king of Israel know what was going on, but the Lord was the one who was gathering the intel. The God of Israel is the, is the omniscient one who was exposing the secret plans of Syria. And what this means is that the king of Syria was failing to recognize who he was actually fighting against. Because if the Lord, you know, he could come along and kill Elisha, but then the Lord would just choose another prophet to reveal the same information through. His problem wasn't with Elisha. His problem was with the Lord. His fight wasn't with the prophet. His fight was with the omnipotent God who, who was choosing to reveal the secret plans of Syria to the king of Israel through Elisha. It's in similar fashion that I've watched people, that they've gotten upset, left our church, mad at me or mad at some other leader in the church. And the reason why is because that leader or myself challenged them about some secret sin in their life. Some sin got exposed. And they think that their issue is with that leader. And so they get mad at the leader. And, you know, oh, that leader, oh, he said this or she said that. What they're failing to realize is that their issue isn't with that leader. Their issue is with the one who sees them in the dark. Their issue is with the Lord. Christian, listen, the Lord is the omniscient one. He is the omnipresent one. And he knows all about the secret desires that we have hidden in our hearts. Therefore, please trust me when I tell you that, that I'm not reading your mail, I'm not trolling your Instagram account, I'm not trying to figure out what you're doing in the dark. I don't have time for that. But if I'm up here and I say something and you're like, oh, he must be talking at me. I'm not talking at you. I'm just telling you what the Lord put on my heart. And if that pierces your heart, don't be mad at me. Take it up with the Lord. He's the one who knows what's happening in your life. I'm simply serving the God who knows what's happening in all of our lives. And so before you begin to think that your fight is with me, I just encourage you to realize that the Lord is the one who, who has given us his holy word, and it's his holy word which is able to discern the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. The, the word is the, that, that, that sharp two-edged sword that's able to go in and pierce the heart. And, and, and according to Paul, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. Look, you can pull the wool over my eyes every day of the week. I'm not a very smart guy. But the, the Lord sees everything. The Lord sees it all. And if he wants to make something known to me and, and use that to, to lead you into a time of repentance, then praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord that he cares for us enough to, to lead us to a place of repentance. The Lord is the omniscient and omnipresent God. And not only that, but listen, he's the omnipotent one who's able to defend those who serve him. But this is our focus. Let's continue to make our way through this incredible chapter. If you would look with me there, we'll pick up at verse 15. Here we read, and when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with him. And the servant said, huh? What are you talking about, Willis? What do you mean those who are with us? There's two of us here. There's an army out there. 
And Elisha prayed, verse 17, and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord, he's demonstrating his omnipotent power. Omnipotence speaks of all powerfulness. And he's helping Elisha's servant to see that there was an, an angelic army which was surrounding the Syrian soldiers. And so there's Elisha and his servant. They're surrounded by this Syrian army, but the Syrian army was surrounded by an angelic army. And in light of this, it's important to understand that those who serve the God of Israel can take great courage in the fact that we are the servants of an omnipotent, all-powerful God who is able to send an army of angels to protect us if he so chooses. It's also important to note that the prophet of God was able to see a spiritual realm which was invisible to everyone else. The Syrian soldiers couldn't see this angelic army. Elisha's servant... This Israelite who was there to support the prophet of God, he couldn't see this angelic army. And with that being the case, it's important to understand that the Lord is able to give spiritual sight to some while withholding that information from others. And there's many times when the Lord will reveal something to a leader that he's not revealing to someone else in the church. And, and, and when the leader says, this is what the Lord is leading us to do, and, and, and the other person says, well, I can't see that. Well, that doesn't mean it's not right. That doesn't mean it's not the Lord. There are times when the Lord will use the leaders around us to help us to see solutions that the Lord is providing. There's times when the Lord will use the leaders around us to, to provide us with information that we can't see. At the same time, though, the Lord is also able to blind the eyes of those who are attempting to see and, and those who are attempting to attack the leaders of the Lord. Uh, well, he has no problem blinding their eyes. And in order to prove my point, look with me there beginning at verse 18. Here we read, so when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So it was when they had come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and they were inside Samaria. Here in these verses we find the Lord, he's, he's, he's striking the Syrian soldiers with blindness according to the prayer of Elisha. And then because of their blindness, well, they failed to realize that Elisha was actually leading them straight to Samaria where they found themselves surrounded by the army of Israel. It's at that moment when, when Elisha prayed again and the Lord opens their eyes and allows them to see that they had just become prisoners of war. Surprise, surprise. The Lord is able to blind the eyes of, of those who don't want to see in the first place. Well, thankfully for them, Elisha showed them the mercy of the Lord. As a matter of fact, look with me there beginning at verse 21. Here we learn that when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elijah, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then he prepared a great feast for them, and after they ate and drank, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. Here in these verses, we find Elijah, he's encouraging the king of Israel. He's actually encouraging the king of Israel to, to, to do the right thing here, to be merciful. You see, the king of Israel sees all these Syrian soldiers, and he's thinking, ah, you know, we've got them. Let's kill them. And Elisha advises him regarding the right way to deal with the Syrian soldiers who had come to kill uh, the very prophet himself. Elisha would have been just to call for their execution. Elisha would have been just to say, these guys came to kill me, so go ahead and kill them. But he didn't. Instead, he encouraged the king to show mercy. Elisha encouraged the king of Israel to show mercy by first feeding them and then by releasing them so that they could return home. 
This reminds me of the Great Commission, which is centered around the instructions that the Lord gave to Paul when Jesus sent him to open the eyes of the blind in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Christian, listen, we've been called to to follow in the footsteps of Elisha by taking those who are spiritually blind to the throne of the king of kings. That's what Elisha did. He took these blind Syrian soldiers and led them to the throne of the king. And the king would have been just to just completely kill them. But Elisha pleaded for mercy. And so the king of Israel was merciful to them. And that's what we've been called to do, Christian. We've been called to take those blind Syrian soldiers and lead them to the throne of the king of kings. And the king of kings is just to destroy them, but he's ready to show them mercy if they'll simply repent. Therefore, I encourage every Christian to follow in the footsteps of Elisha by helping those who are spiritually blind to understand that the Lord Jesus is the king of kings and he has the power to forgive them, but he also has the power to condemn them. The choice is completely theirs to make. Sadly, uh, there will be those who take offense to this message, much like the king of Syria took offense to the capture and release of his men. But this is our focus. Let's consider the way that the king of Syria responded. We uh, pick up our study there at verse 24. Here we learn that it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And indeed they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cob of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. Here in these verses we find the Syrian army invading the area which became known as Samaria. And as a result, the people in the region there fled into the walled city of Samaria where they soon found themselves starving uh, for a lack of food. And the reason why is because the Syrians had come and surrounded the city. This was common military strategy during this day and age to surround a city and cut it off from the outside world. In this way, the invading army would prevent the people uh, from receiving fresh food, uh, food from outside the city walls, and, and the siege would continue until the people starved to death inside or came out and surrendered. And so we see that this was what was happening when, when the king of Syria received his men back. He said, well, I'm taking the whole army, and I'm going to go capture Elisha. And it was during this time when a donkey's head was sold for 80 pieces of silver. They didn't typically eat donkeys, but at this point in time, you could buy a head for a whole bunch of money. And and not only that, but a cup of dove's dung sold for five pieces of silver. I don't know if you've ever had dove dung before, but mm, mm, mm. it's not just for breakfast anymore. But seriously, that's all they had to eat. Donkeys and dove dung. And if you think that's bad, trust me, it gets much, much worse. As a matter of fact, look with me here, beginning at verse 26. Here we learn that the king of Israel is passing by on the wall. A woman cried out to him saying, help my Lord, O king. And he said, if the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? Then the king said to her, what is troubling you? And she answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give your son that we may ate him. Uh, But she has hidden her son. I mean, how horrific is this? That these two women were attempting to deal with the dilemma that they found themselves in in in, in this horrible way. And and, and the truth be told, they're, they're all starving to death. These babies are starving to death. These women are starving to death. Everyone's starving to death. So these two women decide to consume their children so that they could survive the siege of the Syrians. And it's sad to say that that, that they're so far gone in their their sinful mindset that this is the solution they come up with. This is how blind they had become, spiritually speaking, that that they didn't just open God's word and and look to God's word for solutions on, on how to deal with this. 
And, and the fact of the matter is that the solutions were already found in the word of God. They had the book of Deuteronomy and the solution for this whole mess was found there in the book of, of Deuteronomy. As a matter of fact, if you would, let's open our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And as you make your way to the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, I just point out that the, that the Lord here is proclaiming promises of blessings that he's, he's promising to pour out upon his chosen people, providing that they were careful to observe the commandments that he had given them. But at the same time, he also announced the curses that would come upon them if they began to worship and serve the idols of the pagan nations. And these curses, well, there's many curses, but one, one of the curses is that they would uh, find themselves being attacked by the enemy and completely overrun. As a matter of fact, look with me here at Deuteronomy chapter 28. Uh, we'll begin reading at verse 52. Here the Lord's describing the attacks that would come upon them and that he would allow. And we see at verse 52 that they shall, the enemy shall besiege you at all your gates until your high and fortified walls in which you trust, come down throughout all your land, and they shall besiege you at all your gates throughout all your land, which the Lord your God has given you. You shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you. Here in these verses, we find the Lord, he's revealing what is going to happen to these people if they begin to worship uh, the, the false gods of the pagan nations. He's already told them in advance what would happen to them if they began to put their own desires before the will of, uh, of the Lord. And it's sad to say that this is exactly what was happening during the days of Elisha. Please trust me when I tell you that the word of God always comes to pass without fail. And it's important to note that the Lord not only presented the cursings upon the people who walked in rebellion, but he also provided them with the solution, and the solution was very simple. The Lord simply required them to repent of their idolatry and return to the true and living God. It's that simple. Rather than eating their sons and their daughters because they're starving to death, all they had to do was repent and return to the Lord. But listen, when you go down a path of sin, and when you're pursuing your own pleasure, you get to a place where you're blind and you can't even see your way, your way out anymore. The will of God no longer makes sense to you. And that's what was happening during the days of Elisha. Rather than repenting, the king of Israel simply hardened his heart against the Lord. And the evidence of this was demonstrated by his hatred of Elisha. In order to prove my point, let's turn back to 2 Kings chapter 6. Here we find the king of Israel calling for the execution of Elisha. And with this as our focus, look with me there beginning at verse 30. Here we learn that it happened when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes and he passed by on the wall. The people looked and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. Then he said, God do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. But Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man ahead of him, but before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door, and hold him fast at the door. Is it not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he was still talking with him, there was the messenger coming down to him. And then the king said, surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Here in the final verses of this chapter, we find the king of Israel, he's ordering now the execution of Elisha. And while it's true that he was wearing sackcloth, which I'll remind you is a sign of repentance, the person who wanted to demonstrate repentance would put on sackcloth and sit in ashes, and, and this would be a, an outward demonstration of, of a broken in, a heart on the inside, and and while he's wearing sackcloth here as this outward sign of repentance, there was no true repentance found in his heart. And you can show all the outward signs of repentance that you want, but God looks in the heart. And you can put on the face of a humble person, and you can cry, cry crocodile tears, but if there's no brokenness in the heart, then it's not real repentance. Repentance. And the king of Israel proved that there was no brokenness in his heart. How do we know this? Well, because he wants to murder the man of God. 
Why? why? Why is he mad at Elisha? Well, if I had to guess why, then it's because all of this happened because the Syrian soldiers wanted to capture Elisha. And after Elisha had captured them, Elisha convinced the king to set them free, which then resulted in this siege of the Syrians. And in the mind of the king of Israel, he's thinking that all of this is because of Elisha. And so his, the solution in his mind is kill Elisha. But then we see in the final verse of this chapter that he's saying, surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? His anger against Elisha was truly anger against the Lord. And, and it's sad that this chapter, you know, it, it ends in, in, in what I would call the wrong spot because it, it interrupts the story and the rest of the story continues on in chapter seven, which we have no time to get into tonight. But as we dig into Kings chapter seven in our next study, we'll see that Elisha then goes on to prophetically promise the end of the famine would take place on the very next day. And they didn't believe him. And as we make our way through the next chapter, we'll see how this prophetic promise was fulfilled, that the Lord actually accomplishes that very promise. But listen, the, the, the king of Israel, he was wearing the signs of repentance while simultaneously harboring hatred for the man of God. And with that being the case, there was no real repentance in his heart. Christian, listen, those who are truly repentant will first of all be quick to confess their own sins. You can always tell someone who's truly repentant because it, it, it becomes a focus on what they've done wrong. Not what everybody else has done wrong. When I hear someone saying, I'm sorry, but you know, it's all these other people and what they did. That's not real repentance. Real repentance is a recognition of what the individual has done wrong. And those who are truly repentant are not only quick to confess their own sins, but they're also ready to forgive those who challenge them along the way. And with that being the case, I would encourage every believer to realize that the heart of true repentance, it leads us into restoring a relationship with God, but then the Lord turns around and helps us to improve the relationships we have with those who have been leading us to repent all along. And so if you've come to a place where you recognize that you need to repent, listen, that repentance not only needs to happen between you and the Lord, but, but it also needs to manifest in your relationships with those that you, maybe you've been harboring hatred towards. And if you find yourself tonight holding a grudge against another believer because they challenged you to change, then I encourage you to realize that your issue might not be with that person, but rather it might be with the Lord. And in your mind, you might think that you're, you're fighting against that individual, but listen, your fight might be with the Lord. And if so, then it's always good to remember that you can't win a fight against the Lord. You feel just, you're never going to win that one. It's also good to remember that the Lord chastens those whom he loves. He chastens his sons and his daughters and he scourges those whom he has received. And therefore, Rather than holding a grudge against the leaders that the Lord uses to challenge us along the way, we'll always do better to remember that the chastening of the Lord will always yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who allow themselves to be trained by it.